pleases. If I may go back for just a very little bit, take up the train of thought where I left off at the noon recess. We were discussing the document bearing a number D203. And I had referred particularly to the third page of that document, and even more particularly to the second paragraph on that page. And I wish to read from a sentence approximately eight or ten lines down in that second paragraph, which reads as follows. The question of restoration of the Wehrmacht will not be decided at Geneva, but in Germany, when we have gained internal strength through internal peace. And I wish to refer again to the same page of the same document and to the last paragraph and the last sentence with reference to the defendant Goering, who was present at that same meeting to which this document refers, the meeting of February 20th, 1933, in Berlin. Goering said that the sacrifices asked for surely would be so much easier for industry to bear if it realized that the election of March 5th will surely be the last one for the next 10 years, probably even for the next 100 years. In a memorandum dated the 22nd day of February, 1933, and for the information of the court in the document book bearing the number D-204, <coughs> Gustav Krupp described this meeting briefly, and in the memorandum wrote that he had expressed to Hitler the gratitude of the 25 industrialists present at the meeting on February 20th, 1933. There are other expressions in that memorandum which we do not deem to be particularly pertinent to the allegations of the indictment with which we're now concerned. And it's offered to establish corroboration of the affidavit of Poole that the meeting was held. And I might point out to the court that this memorandum, together with the report of the speech of Hitler, were found by the British and the United States armies in the files of the defendant Krupp, in the personal files of the defendant Krupp. I'm aware, if Your Honors, please, that the method that I am pursuing here is a little tedious uh, because I am trying to refer specifically to uh, the documents and particularly to the excerpts uh, referred to in my remarks. And therefore, this presentation differs uh, very considerably from that which has gone before. I. Uh, I trust, however, that you will bear with me because this part of the case requires some rather careful and detailed explanation. In April of 1933, after Hitler had entrenched himself in power, 
Gustav Krupp, as chairman of the Reich Association of German Industry, which was the largest association of German industrialists, submitted to Hitler the plan of that association for the reorganization of German industry. And in connection therewith, undertook to bring the association into line with the aims of the conspirators and to make it an effective instrument for the execution of their policies. In a letter of transmittal, Krupp stated that the plan of reorganization, which he submitted on behalf of the Association of Industrialists, was characterized by the desire to coordinate economic measures and political necessity, adopting the Fuhrer conception of the new German state. A copy of that letter of transmittal is set out in the document book under the number D-157. In the plan of reorganization itself, Krupp stated, the turn of political events is in line with the wishes which I myself and the board of directors have cherished for a long time. In reorganizing the Reich Association of German Industry, I shall be guided by the idea of bringing the new organization into agreement with the political aims of the Reich government. The ideas expressed by Krupp on behalf of the members of the Reich Association of German Industry for introducing the leadership principle into industry were subsequently adopted. And I respectfully refer the court to the Reich's Gesetzblatt of 1934, part one, 1194, sections 11, 12 and 16. Under the decree introducing the leadership principle into industry, each group of industry was required to have a leader who was to serve without compensation. The leaders were to be appointed and could be removed at the discretion of the Minister of Economics. The charter of each group was to be decreed by the leader who was obligated to lead his group in accordance with the principles of the National Socialist State. I think it is fair to argue that the introduction of the leadership principle into the organizations of business permitted the centralization of authority and guaranteed the efficient execution of orders which the government issued to business in the interests of the promotion of a war economy. And the overwhelming support given by German industrialists to the Nazi war program is very vividly described in a speech prepared by Gustav Krupp in January of 1944 for delivery at the University of Berlin. And I must again respectfully refer your honors to the document in your book bearing the identification numbers D317. I shall not, of course, bore this court with a, a reading of that whole uh, document.
but I should like to quote from it without wrenching any of the material from its true context. And this statement is found beginning in the third, uh, in the fourth paragraph, being the first large paragraph on the first page. War material is life-saving for one's own people, and whoever works and performs in those spheres can be proud of it. Here, enterprise as a whole finds its highest justification of existence. This justification, I may inject this here, crystallized especially during the time of interregnum between 1919 in 1933, when Germany was lying down disarmed, it is the, and further on, it is the one great merit of the entire German war economy that it did not remain idle during these, those bad years, even though its activity could not be brought to light for obvious reasons. Through years of secret work, scientific and basic groundwork was laid in order to be ready again to work for the German armed forces at the appointed hour without loss of time or experience. And further quoting from that same speech, and the last paragraph, particularly on the first page, only through this secret activity of German enterprise together with the experience gained meanwhile through production of peacetime goods, was it possible after 1933 to fall Go on. to fall into step with the new tasks arrived at restoring Germany's military power. Only through all that could the entirely new and various problems brought up by the Führer's four-year plan for German enterprise be mastered. It was necessary to exploit new raw materials, to explore and experiment to invest capital in order to make German economy independent and strong. In short, to make it war worthy. And quoting even further from this same speech, I think I may state here that the German enterprises followed the new ways enthusiastically that they made the great intentions of the Führer their own by fair competition and conscious gratitude and became his faithful followers. How else could the tasks between 1933 and 1939, and especially those after 1939, have been overcome? It must be emphasized that the secret rearmament program was launched immediately upon the seizure of power by the Nazi conspirators. On April 4th of 1933, the Reich cabinet passed a resolution establishing a Reich Defense Council the function of this council was secretly to mobilize for war. And at the second meeting of the working committee of the councillors for Reich Defense, which was, by the way, the predecessor of the Reich Defense Council, at that second meeting, which was held on May 22nd of 1933, the chairman, was the defendant Keitel, 
then Colonel title. And he stated that the Reich Defense Council would immediately undertake to prepare for war emergency. He stressed the urgency of the task of organizing a war economy and announced that the Council stood ready to brush aside all other obstacles. Fully aware of the fact that their action was in flagrant violation of the Treaty of Versailles, the defendant Keitel emphasized the extreme importance of absolute secrecy when he said, and I quote from the document bearing the number EC 177 and page five of that document, Colonel Keitel was speaking and he said, no document ought to be lost since otherwise it may fall into the hands of the enemy's intelligence service. Orally transmitted matters are not provable. They can be denied by us in Geneva. The singleness of purpose with which the Nazi conspirators geared the German economy to the forging of a war machine is even further shown by the secret minutes of the sixth meeting of the working committee of the so-called Reich Defense Council held on the 7th of February, 1934 as shown in the document bearing the number EC-404. Marked secret command matter and dated the 7th of February, 1934. At this meeting, Lieutenant General Beck pointed out that the actual state of preparation is the purpose of this session. And parenthetically, I might say that on the first page of that document, it appears that besides Lieutenant General Beck, the defendant Yodel was present, then Lieutenant Colonel Yodel. There was a Captain Schmunt, and there was a Colonel Guderian there. There was a Major General von Reichenau. There was a Major Wallemont. And these are names that your honors will hear more of in the course of the presentation of this case. Detailed measures of financing a future war were discussed. And it was pointed out that the financial aspects of the war economy would be regulated by the Reich Finance Ministry and the Reichsbank, which was headed by the defendant shock. On May 31st of 1935, as stated earlier, are you passing from I am, Your Honor. Very well. Go on. As was stated earlier, in this morning's discussion. The defendant Schock was secretly appointed plenipotentiary general of the war economy. And he had the express function of placing all economic forces of the nation in the services of the Nazi war machine. By the secret defense law of May 21st, 1935, under which Schock received the secret appointment he was, in effect, given charge of the entire war economy. In case of war, he was to be virtual economic dictator of Germany. His task 
was to place all economic forces into the service for the conduct of the war and to secure economically the life of the German people. The ministers of economy, of food, agriculture, labor, forestry, as well as all Reich agencies directly under the Fuhrer were subordinated to him. He was to be responsible for the financing as well of the conduct of the war. And he was even authorized to issue ordinances within his sphere of responsibility, even if these deviated from the existing laws. The rearmament of Germany proceeded at an amazingly rapid pace. By the summer of 1935, the Nazi conspirators were emboldened to make plans for the reoccupation of the Rhineland. And at the 10th meeting of this same working committee of the council, the question of measures to be taken in connection with the proposed reoccupation of the Rhineland were discussed. And I refer to the document bearing the number EC 405. At that meeting, held on the 26th day of June, 1935, it was said the Rhineland required special treatment because of the assurances given by Hitler to the French that no military action was being undertaken in the de demilitarized zone. Among the matters requiring special treatment was the preparation of economic mobilization, a task specifically entrusted to the defendant shock as secret plenipotentiary for the war economy. From this document? I'm quoting in part from it, John, and it is upon the document that I base my statements, which can be found therein. On pages four and five. I dislike uh, annoying the court with constant references to these documents, but I thought it would be the best way to proceed so as to fully inform. Well, the if court. you tell us where it is in the document, we Very can well. follow it in the document. It's on page four. Your Honor, please. Yes, go on. On page four, in the middle of the page, the fifth paragraph, the first sentence, the demilitarized zone requires special treatment. Yes. On page five, J, under the preparations, preparation of economic mobilization. On page four, The last paragraph just before the setting out of the A, B, C, and D. It is said I since think you should, I, I think you ought to read on page four the last paragraph, yes, but that one, is, since political entanglement. That is the one I was just proceeding to read. Very well. I thought you'd gone to page five. No, page four. <coughs> since political entanglements abroad, must be avoided at present under all circumstances. Only those preparatory measures that are urgently necessary may be carried out. The existence of such preparations or the intention of them must be kept in strictest secrecy. In the zone itself, 
as well as in the rest of the Reich. The preparations are then set out, and they include, as I have indicated a few minutes ago, as the last one in the list, the preparation for economic mobilization. There are many others, of course, the preliminary mustering of horse-drawn and motor vehicles, preparation for evacuation measures, and so forth. We say, passing now from that document, we say the rapid success of the German rearmament is attributable in, to the greatest extent to the work of the defendant shot. In the fall of 1934, the Nazi conspirators announced the so-called new plan aiming at the control of imports and exports in order to obtain the raw materials which were needed for armaments and the foreign currency which was required to sustain the armament program. This new plan was the creation of the defendant shock. And under the plan, the defendant shock controlled imports by extending the system of supervisory boards for import control, which was previously limited to the main groups of raw materials, to all goods imported into Germany, whether raw materials, semi-manufactured goods, or finished products. The requirement of licenses for imports enabled the Nazi conspirators to restrict imports to those commodities which served their war aims. Subsequently, in February of 1935, the Devisen Law was passed, which can be found by reference in the Reichsgesetz Blot of 1935, part one, page 105. And under it, all transactions involving foreign exchange were subject to the approval of the Wiesenstellen, the foreign exchange control offices. By thus controlling the disposition of foreign exchange, the conspirators were able to manipulate foreign trade so as to serve their needs and desires. Thus, every aspect of the German economy was being geared to war under the guidance, particularly of the defendant shock. In a study of the economic mobilization for war, as of the 30th of September, 1934, it was stated that steps had already been taken to build up stockpiles, to construct new facilities for the production of scarce goods, and to redeploy industry to secure areas and to control fiscal and trade policies. References were made to the fact that the task of stockpiling had been hampered by the requirement of secrecy and camouflage. Reserves of automobile fuels and stocks of coal were being accumulated, and the production of synthetic oil was accelerated. Civilian supply was purposely organized so that most plants would be working for the German armed forces. Studies were made of the possibility of barter trade with supposedly neutral countries in case of war. The matter of financing the armament program presented a difficult program for the conspirators. In 1934 and in 1935, the German economy could by no possibility have raised funds for their extensive rearmament program through taxes and public loans. From the outset, the armament program involved the engagement of the last reserve. 
Apart from the problem of raising the huge sums required to sustain this program, the Nazi conspirators were exceedingly anxious in the early stages to conceal the extent of their feverish armament activities. And after considering various techniques of financing the armament program, the defendant Schock proposed the use of so-called MEFO bills, M-E-F-O. One of the primary advantages of this method was the fact that figures indicating the extent of rearmament that would have become public through the use of other methods could be kept secret through the use of MIFO bills. And MIFO bills were used exclusively for armament financing. Now, transactions in MIFO bills worked as follows. MIFO bills were drawn by armament contractors and accepted by a limited liability company, the initials of which spelled MIFO, from whence the transaction uh, takes its name. This company had a nominal capital of one million Reichsmarks and was therefore merely a dummy organization. The bills were received by all German banks for possible rediscounting with the Reichsbank. And the bills were guaranteed by the Reich. Their secrecy was assured by the fact that they appeared neither in the published states statements of the Reichsbank or in the budget figures. The MIFO bill system continued to be used until April 1st of 1938. To that date, 12 billion Reichsmarks of MIFO bills for the financing of rearmament had been issued. Since it was no longer deemed necessary in 1938, in April of 1938, to conceal the vast progress of German rearmament, MIFO financing was discontinued at that time. A further source of funds, which the defendant shocked, drew upon to finance the secret armament program, were the funds of political opponents of the Nazi regime and marks of foreigners on deposit in the Reichsbank. And Schock stated, our armaments, and I am quoting, our armaments are also financed partly with the credits of our political opponents. That statement may be found in a memorandum from the defendant Schock to Hitler dated the third day of May 1935, and it bears the number in the document book of 1168-PS, and the specific sentence is found in the second paragraph. The outstanding MIFO bills at all times represented a threat to the stability of the currency because they could be tended to the Reichsbank for discount in which case the currency circulation would automatically have to be increased. Thus, there was an ever-present threat of inflation. The defendant Schock continued on his course because he stands, he said, with unswerving loyalty to the Fuhrer, because he fully recognizes the basic ideas of National Socialism and because at the end, the disturbances do not compared to the great task can be considered irrelevant. High ranking military officers paid tribute to the defendant Schock's contrivances on behalf of the Nazi war machine. In an article written for the Military Weekly Gazette 
in January of 1937. It is said, the German Defense Force commemorates Dr. Schock today as one of the men who have done imperishable things for it and its development in accordance with the directions from the Führer and Reich's Chancellor. The Defense Force owes it to Schock's skill and great ability that in defiance of all currency difficulties, it, according to plan, has been able to grow up to its present strength from an army of 100,000 men. After the reoccupation of the Rhineland, the Nazi conspirators redoubled their efforts to prepare Germany for a major war. The four-year plan, as we have indicated earlier, was proclaimed by Hitler in his address at the Nuremberg Party Convention on the ninth day of September in 1936. And it was given a statutory foundation by the decree concerning the execution of the four-year plan, dated the 18th day of October, 1936, which is found in the Reichsgesetz Blatt of 1936 in the first part at page 887. By this decree, the defendant Goering was put in charge of the plan. He was authorized to enact any legal and administrative measures deemed necessary by him for the accomplishment of his task and to issue orders and instructions to all government agencies including the highest Reich authorities. The purpose of the plan was to enable Nazi Germany to attain complete self-sufficiency in essential raw material, notably motor fuel, rubber, textile fiber, and non-ferrous metals, and to intensify preparations for war. The development of synthetic products was greatly accelerated despite their high costs. Apart from the self-sufficiency program, however, the Nazi conspirators required foreign exchange to finance propaganda and espionage activities abroad. Thus, in a speech on November 1st of 1937, before the Wehrmacht Academy, General Thomas stated, if you consider that one will need during the war considerable means in order to organize the necessary propaganda, in order to pay for the espionage service and for similar purposes, then one should be clear that our internal mark would be of no use, therefore, and that foreign exchange will be needed. This particular need for foreign exchange was reduced in part by the virtue of the espionage and propaganda services rendered free of charge to the Nazi state by some leading German industrial concerns. I hold in my hand a document bearing the number D206. It's dated at Essen, the 12th day of October, 1935. It was found in the files of the Krupp Company by representatives of the United States and the British Army. I shall not read all of it unless your honors require it. But I start at the beginning by way of establishing its purpose and the information contained therein. It is entitled Memorandum. And there is a subheading, Concerns, with a colon and a dash. 
distribution of official propaganda literature abroad with the help of our foreign connections. <clears throat> it goes on to say that on the morning of October 11th, the district representative of Ribbentrop's private foreign office, Dean Stella Ribbentrop, made an appointment for a conference by telephone and that a Mr. Lackman arrived at the appointed time. In answer to my question with whom I was dealing and which official bureau he represented, he informed me that he was not himself the district representative of Ribbentrop's private foreign office, that a Mr. Landrat Boland was such, and that he himself had come at Mr. Bowman's order. The next paragraph states that they had, there exists a great mix-up in the field of foreign propaganda and that Ribbentrop's private foreign office wants to create a tighter organization for foreign propaganda. For this purpose, the support of our firm and above all, an index of addressees were needed. And the next sentence of the third paragraph I would like to read, I am informed that I informed Mr. L that our firm had put itself years ago at the disposal of official bureaus for purposes of foreign propaganda and that we had supported all requests addressed to us to the utmost. I now hold in my hand the document bearing the number D-167, which is also a copy of a document found in the files of the Crook Company by representatives of the American and the British Army. It is dated the 12th day of October, 1937. It is dated the 14th day of October, 1937, and states that it is a memorandum of Herr Sonnenberg on the meeting at Essen on the 12th day of October, 1937. And it indicates that one Menzel, representing the intelligence of the Combined Services Ministry, his department coming under the defense office, asked for intelligence on foreign armaments, but not including matters published in newspapers. Received intelligence received by Krupp from their agents abroad and through other channels to be passed on to the combined services intelligence. intelligence. And finally, the third paragraph states that on our part, we undertook to supply information to the Combined Services Ministry as required. I have concluded reading from that document, and I pass now to discuss the conspirators' program proceeded as I have said so many times here today, with amazing, really amazing speed. The production of steel, for example, as shown in official German publications, rose as follows. In the year 1933, 74,000 tons were produced. In 34, 105,000 tons. 35, 145,000 tons. 36, 186,000 tons. 1937, 217,000 tons. And in 1938, 477,000 tons. The production of gasoline increased at even a greater tempo from 370,000 tons in 1934 
to 14,094,000 tons in 1938. The Nazi conspirators pressed the completion of the armament program with a sense of urgency which clearly indicated their awareness of the imminence of war. At a 4th of September meeting in 1936, Gehring pointed out that all measures have to be taken just as if we were actually in the state of imminent danger of war. He pointed out that if war should break out tomorrow, we would be forced to take measures from which we might shy away at the present moment. They are therefore to be taken. The extreme urgency was manifested by Goering's remark that existent reserves will have to be touched for the purpose of carrying us over this difficulty until the goal ordered by the Fuhrer has been reached. In case of war, he added, they are not a reliable backing in any case. By a top secret letter, a letter marked top secret, on the 21st of August of 1936, the defendant Schacht was advised that Hitler had ordered that all formations of the Air Force be ready by April 1st of 1937. This served to accentuate the urgent sense of immediacy that had pervaded the Nazi war economy from the outset. Flushed with their successes in the Rhineland, the Nazi conspirators were laying the groundwork for further aggressive action. As far as I understand you, you haven't referred us to any documents since uh, document uh, 167. No, Your Honor, the figures from on the uh, production of steel and of oil are from the statistical yearbook for the German Reich of 1939 and 1940, and the statistical yearbook for the German Reich of 1941 and 42. Uh, that is with respect to the steel figures. And the figures which I quoted with respect to the production of gasoline are from the statistical yearbook for the German Reich in 1941 and 1942. The statements of the defendant Goering are based upon the document marked EC416 in the document book. <coughs> A remark about the... That's a document you've already re uh, referred to, isn't it? Yes, it's been referred to here before, uh, please. But some of these documents contain references to more than one part of this presentation, and I have to refer to them uh, at different times in the presentation of this part All right, of the case. All right, go on if you want to refer to it. Sixth paragraph on the first page. The existing reserves will have to be touched for the purpose of carrying us over this difficulty until the goal ordered by the Fuhrer has been reached. And then, in case of war, they are not a reliable backing in any case. And on the second page, the eighth paragraph down. If war should break out tomorrow, we would be forced to take measures from which we might possibly still shy away at the present moment. They are, therefore, to be taken.
with reference to the assertion that the defendant Schacht was advised that Hitler had ordered all, that all formations of the Air Force be ready by April 1, 1937. I respectfully refer to document 1301-PS. Dated 31st of August, 1936. I'm advised that that document should bear an additional number. It should read 1301-PS-7. On the second page, on the first page, Your Honors, please, the third paragraph, or the paragraph marked three, and after it, the words Air Force. The third page? No, on the first page, Your Honor, of 1301 PS-7. please, it is page 19 of the group of documents bearing the serial 1301 PS. Our documents aren't paged. Our documents are not... I think you'll find, your honor, in the upper left-hand corner, oh, yes, very near to the top and over at the extreme left. Yes, I've got page 19 now of this document. The paragraph number three, after it, the words Air Force. Yes. It states that according to an order of the Führer, the setting up of all Air Force units had to be completed on April 1st, 1937. And if your honors will turn the page to page 20, about midway in the page, you'll observe that a copy of this document was sent to the president of the Reichsbank, Dr. Schock. Yes, what are you passing to now? I'm now passing to a discussion. I'm not passing to another document immediately, Your Honor. After their successes in Austria and in the Sudetenland, the Nazi conspirators redoubled their efforts to equip themselves for a war of aggression. And in a conference on October 14th, 1938, shortly before the Nazi conspirators made their first demands on Poland, the defendant Goering stated, that the Fuhrer had instructed him to carry out a gigantic program by comparison with which the performances thus far were insignificant. This faced difficulties which he would overcome with the greatest energy and ruthlessness. And that statement may be found in the document 1301-PS and on page 25 of that document. and particularly the third sent the second sentence of the opening paragraph. Everybody knows from the press what the world situation looks like, and therefore the Fuhrer has issued an order to him. That's not page 25, is it? Is that page 25 of 1301? Yes, Your Honor. Okay. 
Yes. Everybody knows from the press what the world situation looks like. And therefore, the Fuhrer has issued an order to him to carry out a gigantic program compared to which previous achievements are insignificant. That there are difficulties in the way which he will overcome with the utmost energy and ruthlessness. The supply of foreign currency had sunken because of preparation for the invasion of Czechoslovakia and it was considered necessary to replenish it. These, and I'm now referring to the third paragraph of that same page 25 of document 1301 PS. These gains made through the export are to be used for an increased armament. The armament should not be curtailed by the export activity. He received the order from the Fuhrer to increase the armament to an abnormal extent, the Air Force having first priority. Within the shortest time, the Air Force is to be increased fivefold. Also, the Navy should get armed more rapidly and the Army should procure large amounts of offensive weapons at a faster rate, <coughs> particularly heavy artillery pieces and heavy tanks. Along with this, manufactured armaments must go, especially fuel. Powder and explosives are to be moved into the foreground. It should be coupled with the accelerated construction of highways, canals, and particularly of the railroads. In the course of these preparations for war, a clash of wills ensued between two men, the defendants Goering and the defendant Schock. As a result of which, the defendant Schock resigned his position as head of the Ministry of Economics and plenipotentiary for the war economy in November of 1937 and was removed from the presidency of the Reichsbank in January of 1939. I do not propose at this moment to go into the details of this controversy. There will be more uh, said on that subject at a later stage in these proceedings. But for the present, I should like to have it noted that it is our contention that Schock's departure in no way implied any disagreement with the major war aims of the Nazis. The defendant Schock took particular pride in his vast attainments in the financial and economic field in aid of the Nazi war machine. And in the document bearing the number EC257, which is a copy of a letter from the defendant Schock to General Thomas. In the first paragraph of the letter, I think back with much satisfaction to the work in the Ministry of Economics, which afforded me the opportunity to assist in the rearmament of the German people in the most critical period, not only in the financial, but also in the economic sphere. I have always considered a rearmament of the German people as conditio sine qua non of the establishment of a new German nation. The second paragraph is of a more personal nature and has no uh, real bearing on the issues before us at this time. In document not labeled EC 252, a letter written to General von Blumberg dated the 8th day of July, 1937. The defendant Schock wrote, 
the direction of the war economy by the plenipotentiary would in that event never take place entirely independent from the rest of the war mechanism, but would be aimed at, an, at accomplishment of the political war purpose with the assistance of all economic forces. I am entirely willing, therefore, to participate in this way in the preparation of the forthcoming order giving effect to the Defense Act. In the spring of 1937, the defendant Schock participated with representatives of the three branches of the armed forces in war games in war economy, which is probably something new by way of, or was something new by way of military exercises. The war games in war economy were held at Gothenburg, in Germany. And I refer to the document bearing the label EC-174. It is a, has as a heading or a subheading under the summary, War Economy Trip to Gothenburg, undertaken by a general staff between the 25th of May and the 2nd of June. And it goes on to outline in uh, some slight detail that there was a welcome to the general staff's war economy trip. It tells something in a rather vague and not altogether clear way of just how a war game in war economy was conducted, but it leaves no doubt in the mind that such a war game in war economy had been conducted at Gothenburg at that time. And on the second page of this document, the last paragraph is a translation of part one of the speech welcoming Dr. Schott. It says, before I start with the discussion of the war game in war economy, I have to express how grateful we all are that you, President Dr. Schock, have gone to the trouble to personally participate in our final discussion today, despite all your other activities. This proves to us your deep interest in war economy tasks, shown at all times, and your presence here is renewed proof that you are willing to facilitate You're for us... You're going too fast. I'm sorry, Your Honor. I'm delighted. This proves to us your deep interest in war economy tasks shown at all times. And your presence here is renewed proof that you are willing to facilitate for us soldiers the difficult war economic preparations and to strengthen the harmonious cooperation with your officers. I should also like to call the court's attention to the next to the last paragraph on the first page. It's a one sentence paragraph and it simply says, I want to point out, however, that all material and all information received has to be kept in strict secrecy. And it refers to the preceding paragraphs concerning the war game in war economy. It appears that the annexation of Austria was a goal which the defendant Schacht had long sought. For in a speech to the employees of the former Austrian National Bank, as set out in the document bearing the label EC-297, and particularly the second paragraph of the first page of that document. 
And right nearly at the end, four or five lines from the end of that paragraph, we find these words after, immediately after large applause, there are these words. Austria has certainly a great mission, namely to be the bearer of German culture, to ensure respect and regard for the German name, especially in the directives of the Southeast. Such a mission can only be performed within the great German Reich and based on the power of a nation of 75 millions, which regardless of the wish of the opponents forms the heart and the soul of Europe. Dr. Schock goes on to say, we have read a lot in the foreign press during the last few days that this aim, the union of both countries, is to a certain degree justified, but that the method of effecting this union was terrible. This method, which certainly did not suit one or another foreign, is nothing but the consequence of countless perfidies and brutal acts of violence which foreign countries have practiced against us. And I refer now to page three of this same document and to the fourth paragraph at about the center of the page. And reading from it, I am known for sometimes expressing thoughts which give offense, and there I would like I would not like to depart from this custom. I know that there are even here in this country a few people. I believe they are not too numerous who find fault with the events of the last few days. But nobody, I believe, doubts the goal. And it should be said to all grumblers that you can't satisfy everybody. One person says he would have done it maybe in one way. But the remarkable thing is that they did not do it and that it was only done by our Adolf Hitler. And if there is still something left to be improved, then those grumblers should try to bring about these improvements from the German Reich and within the German community, but not to disturb it from without. In a memorandum of the 7th of January, 1939, written by the defendant Schock and other directors of the Reichsbank to Hitler, urging a balancing of the budget in view of the threatening danger of inflation, it was stated, and I now refer to the document bearing the label EC369, and particularly, to the paragraph at the bottom of the first page of that document. From the beginning, the Reichsbank had been aware of the fact that a successful foreign policy can be attained only by the reconstruction of the German armed forces. It, in parentheses, the Reichsbank, therefore assumed to a very great extent the responsibility to finance the rearmament in spite of the inherent dangers to the currency. The justification thereof was the necessity which pushed all other considerations into the background to carry through the armament at once, out of nothing, and furthermore under camouflage, which made a respect commanding foreign policy possible.
the Reichsbank directors, as experts on money, believed that a point had been reached where greater production of armaments was no longer possible. We say that was merely a judgment on the situation and not a moral principle, for there was no opposition to Hitler's policy of aggression. Doubts were ascertained only as to whether he could finance that policy. Hitler's letter to Schacht on the occasion of Schacht's departure from the Reichsbank, as contained in document EC 397, pays high tribute to Schacht's great efforts in furthering the program of the Nazi conspirators. The armed forces by now had enabled Hitler to take Austria and the Sudetenland. We say Schock's task up to that point had been well done. And to quote from document EC 397, in the words of Hitler in the letter which he wrote to the defendant Schock, your name above all will always be connected with the first epoch of the national rearmament. Even though dismissed from the presidency of the Reichsbank, Schacht was retained as a minister without portfolio and special confidential advisor to Hitler. The defendant Funk stepped into Schacht's position as president of the Reichsbank. And I ask at this point that the court might take judicial notice of the Werkische Beobachter for January 21st, 1939. The defendant Funk was completely uninhibited by fears of inflation. For like Goering, under whom he had served in the four-year plan, he recognized no obstacles to the plan to attack Poland. In document 699 PS, a letter from the defendant Funk to Hitler. Written on August 25th of 1939, only a few days before the attack on Poland. The defendant Funk reported to Hitler that the Reichsbank was prepared to withstand any disturbances of the international currency and credit system occasioned by a large-scale war. He said that he had secretly transferred all available funds of the Reichsbank abroad into gold, and that Germany stood ready to meet the financial and economic tasks which lay ahead. And so it seems plain and clear from the writings, from the acts, from the speeches of the Nazi conspirators themselves that they did in fact direct the whole of the German economy toward preparation for aggressive war. To paraphrase the words that the defendant Goering once used, these conspirators gave the German people guns instead of butter. And they also gave, we say, they also gave history its most striking example of a nation gearing itself in time of peace to the single purpose of aggressive war. Their economic preparations formulated and applied with ruthless energy for the defendant Goering with cynical financial wizardry by the defendant Schacht and the willing complicity of Funk, among others, were the indispensable first act in the heartbreaking tragedy which their aggression inflicted upon the world. 